The other thing I want to mention is um, if you have a question during the lecture, please put it in the chat. I usually check the chat every couple of minutes. Um, after I'm done lecturing, we will open up all the mics and anybody can ask any questions about assignments, about um, labs, or anything like that. And for those of you who are first time joiners, I said this on week one and I'll say it again this week, the challenges are not required. So you do not have to do the challenges because they are not part of your grade. So I encourage you to do them, but it's not required. So now we're going to talk about strings, and specifically strings and lists, because a string is, in fact, a form of a list. Um, first of all, why are we talking? Why are we spending an, almost a whole module talking about strings? Um, that's because Python just about assumes everything is a string, unless you tell it otherwise. Um, anything that comes in from that input statement that you're going to use is definitely a string. That's why you have to convert it. So it is, so that's why. A lot of stuff you're going to be doing with, um, in Python in this class is pretty much with strings. And when you get out into the real world, if you choose to program and program in Python, it's going to be a lot about strings. So what is a string? It is an ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes. Literally, that is it. Okay, that's what makes a string in Python. And it's immutable, which mean a, means a string cannot be changed. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means practically and how we get around it in a little bit. So. If I'm thinking about a string, what you see is an ordered set of characters surrounded by quotes. Now, we'll go back a little bit from last week. What you're seeing here in this line is I have a variable called Meister. I know Meister is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign is the value I am assigning to my stir. And in this case, it's a string called, quote, this is a string. So that's what a string is. But what does Python see? Python sees the name of the variable, which is my stir, and it actually sees a list. You can think of a string as a list. Each, char each individual character next to the next character ends up being the string, and that includes spaces, punctuation, invisible characters, like new lines and tabs. They all take up one of these boxes. Um, so that is what Python sees. Python doesn't necessarily see, quote, this is a string quote. What it sees is a, a series of characters next to each other in a specific order. So something to remember. For every open quote, there must be a closing quote of the same type. So you can have, you can create strings in Python with two different types of quotes, with a single quote or a double quote. If you open a string with a single quote, you got to close it with a double, sorry, a single quote, you got to close it with a single quote. If you open it with a double quote, you got to close it with a double quote. It's called being balanced. You have to have them balanced. What is not a string? Um, again, you got to have both quotes. So this one is missing an end quote. And I'm doing some of this just because you're going to see some of these issues when you're programming. Because even as a, an experienced programmer, I sometimes forget to hit that quote at the end of the string. And I go back and I'm like, what did I do? So. Um, this is also a syntax error because we are opening it with one type of quote, in this example, a double quote, and we are closing it with a different type of quote, a single quote. This is also a syntax error because even though I open it with a double quote and close it with a double quote, there's a double quote on the inside, which kind of 
confuses Python. Python can't figure out what to do with this three quote situation. So what it does is it says, oh, I've found my matching quote. And in this case, it would be the double quote before string. And then you would have this thing string and then another double quote. And Python wouldn't know what that was. So Python cannot handle quotes inside other quotes of the same type. So if that had been a single quote, we would have been fine. If the opening and closing quotes were single quotes and we put a double quote in the middle, that would have been fine. But because we're using quotes all of the same type, this would be a syntax error. So you're going to see the rules and some of them are going to repeat and that's because I think they're important. So how do we correct those syntax errors? Well, the one that doesn't have a closing quote, we give it a closing quote. The one that has an open double quote and a closed single quote, we give a closed double quote too. And the one that has the quote, the double quote inside of two double quotes, we can do a couple of things. If I wanted it to remain as a double quote, I can use an escape. I can escape it with the uh, slash, backslash. I'm sorry, I can never remember, backslash or slash. But that way slash um, escapes it so Python doesn't see it as an indicator that a string is beginning or ending. Python just sees it as a character because when we look at strings and we saw that list, this is a string, there were no quotes. And that's because Python does not include the quotes as part of the string. It is simply um, a moniker to Python that what's coming after the first double quote is a string. And then when it gets to the final double quote, it's done with that string. So that's what's important. That's why you have to escape it because Python treats quote, dip quotes differently than normal characters. Okay, so what do I mean by ordered? Well, ordered is basically I've got this string. Now, if I, if I misspelled it and I said this SI is a string, it would still be an ordered collection. And how do I know that it's ordered? And what does ordered mean? Well, what Python sees is an individual list of characters. And in that list, Python automatically gives every character in that list of characters a number. The numbering always starts at zero. And I call it an index. Most, most things call it an index. So every single character, whether it's visible or not, in a string has a corresponding number. And that corresponding number talks about the order. So when you are looking at the capital T, its place in the list is zero. So that would be the first place. If I'm looking for a capital S, capital S is number 10, which is the actually 11th place in the list, because all lists in Python start with an index of zero. It never changes. The first, the first character in a string, the first element on a list is always going to be zero. And it's going to go until the end, which is one minus, in this case, the number of characters. But that's what Python sees. And that's what Python does. We don't have to tell Python to give it a number. We just, Python just gives it a number. And there's a reason that it gives it a number. Because if I want to get at a specific item in this string, a specific character, I can do it by using that number. OK. So and the, one of the ways to read this is t is at index 0, h is at index 1, i is at index 2, and so on. Um, and it's important not just to understand how to write code, but you got to understand how to read it. 
and uh, because you're going to write a piece of code and it may be complex and a year down the road you've got to go back and look at that code and so you have to know how to read it I mean I'm looking at a large section of code written by somebody else three years ago that was not well documented and I'm reading through that code trying to figure out what it does so reading code is just as important as writing and you would think they're the same but they're not quite okay every character in a string has a numerical placeholder let's call it the index okay a string is a list so actually let me see yes Yes, Julio, this is recorded. Um, and oh, thank you very much, Jenny. So let's go and see what I've got. Um, simple string. So this is just, oh no, this is farther on strings. Is that it? Um, no, we'll keep going with the discussion and we'll come back to these not quite there yet so why are we all of a sudden talking about lists because we have to understand the principles of lists to understand the principles of strings because a string is a list it just can't be changed at least not directly um, so a list is an ordered collection of elements in our case we have a string and a string is an ordered collection of characters so the characters are the elements and for a list, an element can be just about anything. It can be another list. It can be a character. It can be a number or a float. It can be an object when we get to module 8 and we're talking about, excuse me, object-oriented Python. It can be an object. It can be a dictionary. It can be lots of things. Lists are mutable, which means they can be changed. So you're going to see in your script, this is a list, okay? I have a variable my list. My list is on the left hand seat of, side of a single equal sign, so I know it's a variable. On the right hand side of a single equal sign, we see a close, we, excuse me, we see a left square bracket. We see the word Lisa. We know it's a string because it's in quotes, a comma, 42, a comma, and 3.14, and a right. Uh, square bracket that's a list now how does Python know it's a list Python knows it's a list because it starts and ends with those square brackets and that could be it could just be square brackets but for what we're doing right now and by the way we're going to talk about lists and dictionaries I think in module five six six module six so we're going to revisit this but we just want to introduce the principles now so this list has three elements. And what do I look like? Okay. So what Python is seeing is there's a name my list and the values are Lisa 42 and 3.14. Lisa is at index 0. 42 is at index 1 and 3.14 is at index 2. And Python says, I know it's a list because I have an opening and a closing square bracket. Everything in the list is considered an element of the list. And it could be a name, it could be a number, it could be an object, it could be another list. Um, and every element has to be separated by a comma. That's how this particular list works. So... Um, so that's a list. That's the basic foundation of a list. When you see a list, when you see something in your code and it has an open square bracket and a closing square bracket, you know that that is a list. It may be um, a different list than you see here, but it is still a list. And it still holds to the same principles we're talking about. Um, lists start with opening and closing square brackets. They contain elements, and the elements can be of any type. Um, everything in a list always has a corresponding index, and that indexing starts at zero. 
List elements are separated by commas. So, CRUD. They don't, they don't really talk about CRUD in iBooks, but I think it's a really important principle, and I will be talking about it a lot in this class, especially when it comes to lists and dictionaries. So CRUD is Create, Read, Update, and Delete. If you've ever done anything with SQL and databases, you might have heard the term CRUD. If not, um, CRUD can be applied to lots of different things in a programming language. The way we apply it to Python lists is C, Create, is Make a New List. R is read, and you're going to access the data within the list. And we're going to learn that in a few minutes. Update is we're going to modify elements within a list, because in a standard list, we can modify elements directly. And delete either removes an element from the list or removes the entire list itself. So let's talk about creating. So I can create a list in two different ways. I can create an empty list or I can create a populated list. An empty list is simply an open square bracket and a closing square bracket with nothing in the middle. And sometimes you're going to want to do this, especially later on when we get into uh, loops. You're going to want to create an empty list and then fill it out during the loop, given what's, whatever's going on within the loop. So this is, but this is just how an empty list looks when you create it. There's nothing in it. You won't be able to access anything in it because there's nothing in it. So I can create a populated list. A populated list is just a list that has things in it. And that's the way I started off in my code. So I can also read from a list. And reading is the new thing that we're learning right now. So how do I get at the word Lisa? from my list. I know I've got three elements in a list, but programmatically, I need to know how to get to that first element. Well, the way we do that is to use the variable that contains the list, and in this case, that variable name is my list, directly after the variable name. There is an open square bracket. There is the index that number associated with the element that I want to get and a closing square bracket. So what you don't see is any equal sign here. So this is the variable name with an opening and closing square bracket and a number in the middle is how you are accessing data in the list. And I can get at anything I want from a list this way. All lists are the same. doesn't matter how big it is. doesn't matter how small it is. This is what you do. You, and sometimes you're, not gonna, you're, you're, you're going to have to figure that internal index out, and we'll look at that later. But for right now, what we have is we have the ability to read. So I can create a list two ways, empty or populated, and I can read data from a list. And I do that using the index number and this specific syntax. And then I can print it. So let's say I want to print the second element in the list. Well, it's the same thing. I can print my list. And I say of, but it's open square bracket, the number two, and close square bracket. And what will print to the screen is 3.14. Update. So I have my list. We saw how to create it the last screen. Now I want to change it. Okay. I don't want the first element to be 42 anymore. I want it to be 25. So what I do is I simply put my list, open square bracket, the index number I want to change, close, close square bracket, equal 25. So in essence, you're using that index as kind of an, an additional variable indicator. So we all know that my list contains the whole list. My list of one is the second element in the list, and I want to change that. And the way I change it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign is the variable that holds the whole list, 
the index number of the element I want to replace. And then on the right hand side of the single equal sign is the value that I want to put in that index or at that index. So that's how I update it. I also can append to the end of a list. So I want to add a, another element to my list. Well, how do I do that? Well, I use a function called append. Last week, we learned about functions. We talked about print, and we talked about input. This week, we're talking about a function that can be done against or on an element. In this case, we have the append function. We know append is a function because directly after the word is a left parenthesis. There's something in the middle, in this case the word add, and a closed parenthesis. That's a function. Now we have this new notation, which is the dot notation. And before that is my list. And what this notation says is, using my list, add the word add to an end, to the end. That's what append does. Append says, put it on the end. Just stick it on the end. So the way you read this is my list dot append add. And so I'm going to append the word add to my list. And that's what the notation, that's what that notation says. So when you see an element with a dot after it and then a function, you are using a function against that individual element. In this case, it's my list. And you'll notice that it just added one to the end, gave it a number. So now instead of three things in my list, I have four. So delete is... I now have four things in my list, and I want to delete the very first thing out of that list. So I will use a new keyword. That keyword is DEL for delete. And I am going to tell it what I wanted to delete. In this case, I wanted to delete the first element in the list. And when I do that, what happened is not only that element goes away, but the list itself is renumbered. So instead of Lisa being at element zero, 25 is at element zero. And then 3.14 is at element one now, and add is at element two. So I shortened the list by deleting an element within the list, and I deleted that because I told Python how to get it based on its index. Okay, so now I want to remove the last thing from the list. So I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it by the element. I just want to say get rid of whatever's at the back at the end of this list. So I do remove. Sorry, I'm still talking. And I, um, so I do remove. Let's go back. Yeah, so I do the remove. And Dell, my list, deletes the entire list. So if you don't have anything, any square brackets after your variable, it's going to get rid of the whole thing. So let's go and, yes, look at a little code. Okay. So we're going to look at CRUD. And again, these scripts will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow along with the video. So what we see here is just what we saw in that slide. Um, so I'm going to make this just a tad bit smaller, I think. There we go. I'm going to run through this really quick. Now, for those of you who might not have been here last week or those of you who want a refresher this week, this is PyCharm, okay? This script is written in PyCharm, and what I'm going to do is I am going to use the debugger on this script so we can actually see what Python is doing. I find the de debuggers massively helpful. So I'm going to edit the configuration. I'm going to go here. Module 2. Right. Okay. So I'm going to debug, and I debug by clicking the little, the little thing that looks like a bug here, and it's going to stop because I've put a breakpoint. And the way to add a breakpoint is simply to write to the right of the number, or just to the right of the number, you put a red dot. All you do is click there and the red dot shows up. 
So why do I want to debug this? Well, I want to look at what's going on with my variables and my lists, and I can do that in the variable screen very easily. So I'm going to step over right now on the lower part of the screen. There's no variables. We don't have anything defined because I haven't actually executed a line of code yet. So I'm going to step over my empty list, and we will see that my empty list now is a variable. It's been created. It's taken up space in memory. It is of type list, and it has zero elements. So now I'm going to print my empty list. I can go to the console. It just shows me the empty list. And by the way, when you print a list or a dictionary or any other structure, you're going to see it as the structure. So you're going to see it with uh, square brackets if it's a list or curly brackets if it's a dictionary. So now I'm going to create my list. My list has just been created. I have, it's a list, it's a type list. There are three elements and you see Lisa 42 and 3.14. So now I'm going to print the elements in the list. I'm going to print my list of zero, and it turns out to be Lisa. Now here you will see that I am using the stir function because I am, uh, 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 sorry, the second element in the list is an integer. And I'm going to add it to a string. And I can't add an integer to a string, so I have to make that integer a string. Now, we'll learn a little bit later how to do some fancy formatting. But for right now, this is what I'm doing. So, And then I'm going to do the same thing with the float. I'm going to turn it into a string. Now, I want to update my list. So let's go back here for a second. And I have my list of it's got Lisa 42 and 3.14. I want to change the, the element at index 1, which will be this 42. By the way, these numbers right here are, in fact, the index numbers. So if I step over this line, we will see that 42 turned to 25. So I'm going to add, which means I'm going to append to it. So I've added an element. I'm going to pop from the bottom of the list, which basically just removes it. I'm going to print the list again. Um, and I'm going to print it one more time after I remove the word add. So that is what create, read, update, and delete is about. So let's keep going. Okay, so why did we talk about lists? A string is a list, but they can't be modified. So how do I change a string if I'm not allowed to change a string? Um, there are functions that you can use on that string that will allow you to modify it. You can always create and read without a problem. But um, to delete, you'll have to delete the entire string. To update a string, you're going to use functions that will create a new string with the modification in it. So if you want to remove a specific character, you're going to need to use a function on that string. So it will be that dot notation. So let's talk about creds and strings. So if I create an empty stir, it just has an open and closing quote. Now it can be a double quote. It can be single quotes as long as they're the same. And there are no characters in between them. Now, sometimes you are going to want to create an empty string and then populate it later. I can create a populated string, which we saw in the slides earlier. So I can read. I can get from a string just like I did that list. My stir of zero is a T. I can print my stir of 10 which is going to be an S, capital S. I can read and create at the same time. This is one of those things you can do to modify a string. So this is called string slicing. And basically what I'm doing is I'm taking a chunk out of that string. 
I am just going to remove a portion, in this case, str. So how do I tell Python that I just want to remove this chunk out of a string? There's a very specific notation. So first of all, you're going to have to have a place to put this new string. It doesn't do you any good to slice the string if you don't put it someplace. So in this case, I have my new stir, my new stir, I, it's a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And by the way, I stopped saying this next week because I'm going to say other things. On the right-hand side of that single equal sign is my variable my stir. And I have my open square bracket. And now I have two, two numbers. I have 10 colon 13 close square bracket. Well, what this says is, hey, Python, get me the elements starting at index 10 and ending before, one before index 13. So it's not inclusive of that last number. So this, in fact, would get me the characters at 10, 11, and 12. So that would be str. But always remember that that ending colon, that the, the ending number after the colon is non-inclusive. So it's always going to be that number minus 1. Okay, you can create a new string from an existing string using slicing. Um, the start ind index is inclusive and the end index is not inclusive. So a little bit more on string slicing because you're going to need it. So there are some shorthands. A shortcut is if I have, I'm trying to slice, which means I have a colon, so I have the square brackets, a number, a colon, and then a square bracket, it's a shorthand for get me everything starting at index number 8 to the end. So in this case, I want it to return a string. And again, have to have some place to put it, so I have my variable, which is on the left-hand side of the single equal sign, called my new stir. And here's another shortcut. I don't want to put the zero there. I just want to tell Python, get me everything starting at the very beginning of the list, so starting at index zero, and going to four minus one, which would be three. So that is how you use string slicing. It's important to remember that you always have a variable on the left-hand side of a slice so that you can capture the string that's going to be returned to you. Okay, so we've got some string methods. And I can do all kinds of things. I can find the first, in, the first index where an S, lowercase s occurs. Because remember, Python is case sensitive. So it's going to, that's what this does. So I have my stir, just a string that I've created. And then I've got this dot notation because I have a period in between my stir and find. So find is a function. I know find is a function because it starts with a left open parenthesis, ends with a right closing parenthesis, and in this case it has a character in the middle called s. And so what this is happening is it's saying, hey, Python, find me the first instance of a lowercase s from my stir. So you can almost read that dot as a from. OK, so let's say I want to replace a portion of the string. I can do that by using a replace function on the string. So I have my stir. I'm going to have, sorry, I'm going to have my new stir, which is what I'm going to populate with the brand new string that I'm creating. I'm going to have, I'm going to have my stir, and I'm going to replace in my stir the word this with the word that. And Python will do just that. It's going to go out. It's going to create a new string. It's going to start it with that. Everything else is going to be the same. And it's going to put it in my new stir. Because remember, my stir doesn't change. So here's another one. And this is important because you're going to need this for a lab this week. Count the number of occurrences of a character in a string. I use 
the function count on Meister. So what happens is I, I have Meister, so I'm going to say count the number of occurrences of a lowercase i from Meister. That's what I'm telling Python to do. And then put the, that number in the variable that's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So those are some th string methods. Possibly going to have to use one, use them. Definitely going to have to use the count. And um, we can go back and look at. I want to make sure we get through everything and the labs tonight, so we can go back and look at some code in a bit if you want. So I can split a string. So what I can do is I can take a string and I can create a list from that string. You're probably going to have to do that this week. So what do I do? I call the dot split method on the string and I give it a character to split where, where it's supposed to stop and cut them in half. So you can basically look at this. Python is, is slicing it at a given character and what it's going to come back with is a list. So in this case, I am taking Meister, which has the, the word first and the word second in it as a whole string, and I'm telling Python, hey, find every occurrence of a comma and anything that's before that comma or between that comma and the next comma, put that into an element in a list. This is very handy because you can get it in all kinds of things and you can split them. And I think you're going to have to do this in a lab. Join says I'm going to take two. I'm going to take a list and I'm going to create a string. I use the join function to do that. I give it my list, and I get a string out of it. Now this string isn't exactly right because um, we probably wanted to put a space in between them. But this is what join does. Okay, it just butts them up against each other. Okay, remember when I said we were going to do some do some better formatting? Well, there's something called the format function that is done on a string in Python, and it's very handy because it helps with code read readability rather than having like this string plus that string plus the other string you can write out what you're going to do and then have basically um, placeholders. So the placeholders are open curly brace followed by a closed curly brace. In most instances, that's all there's going to be. There's one instance here where you have to, you're going to have something else. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So I have a string. It doesn't have to be in a print statement, but it all it, it a lot of times is. Um, so I have a string, and on that string, I'm going to have a dot. That dot notation says, Python, do what I need done to the string that's on the left-hand side. What am I going to do? I'm going to format it. I'm going to format it by adding these three elements. I'm going to add an element called num1, an element float num, and an element Meister. So how does this work? Well, we've got our placeholders. The middle one is a placeholder with a format. The placeholder with a format basically says you're expecting a specific type of value. And because I can, I, I can get that specific type of value, I want to format it specially. And what this says is it's going to be a float, F, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure there are only two decimal places after the whole number part of that float. Uh, let's see. Okay. So here's an example. I have num1, which is 42. I have the pi, which is 3.14 and I have Meister, which is Pi Day. Now you'll notice how those arrows were, and they are positional. So in my case, num1 always goes to the, fir to the first placeholder. 
float one will always go to the second placeholder. My stir will always go to the third placeholder. That's just the way it is. So here I have a different one. And uh, this is going to cause problems because, oh, no, it's not because it did. Ah, that's what happened. Okay, that is a syntax error. I was reading it wrong. So you have 42 going to the first one. And then even though I have pi here, I have my stir in the second place. My stir is not a float, and Python's going to have a problem with it, and it's going to give you a syntax error. Okay, so let's go through the labs. And then we can go back and look at some code. So lab 2.12. Um, basically, this is not a fair lab. Um, because you have to use conditionals, which we don't really talk much about until next week. This is the only time I will do that, that do this in the class, but in the description, there will be a link to the solution because we don't teach you enough for you to get a good grade on this lab. So but we're going to go over it for just a minute. And basically what it is, is you're going to split a string using a delimiter. And then you're going to take that split string and you're going to output one of two formats. So if the input has three elements, then you're going to put last name, comma, first name, dot, middle initial, period. Sorry, first initial, dot, middle initial. If there are only two elements in that, um, in the list that that comes in from, that's split from the input, you're going to have last name, comma, first initial, period. Now you'll notice I used the word if several times. That's because Lab 2.12 requires conditional. Because we haven't talked about them, we don't talk about conditionals in any way, shape, or form till next week. The, the, the Lab 2.12 will be up on the YouTube drive. Okay, so we can just do a little bit of flow charting here. So I'm going to declare a variable called name. I'm going to input either last name, first name, yeah, last name, first name, and middle initial. I'm going to declare a name list. I'm going to split that name into something in the list. So this diamond we're going to talk about more next week. But I'm going to like, if the length of the name list is greater than two, if it's false, then I'm going to output something specific. I'm going to output just the two things, and I'm going to end. And if not, I'm going to output three things. And then I'm going to end. And by the way, we're also asking you to do uh, nested lists and to, to treat it as, as you know how to do a nested list. And you don't yet. So that's the basic flow chart for Lab 2.12. Lab 2.13, I don't give you the answer for. We talk about it here. Um, I'm going to write a program whose input is a string which contains a character and a phrase, and whose output indicates the number of times the character appears in the phrase. Sounds like a good use for the count function. So I'm going to input. I'm going to declare myster. I'm going to input myster. I'm going to declare my list. I'm going to split my myster into a list. I'm going to declare the the yeah, sorry, the variable my count. Sorry about this, this is just in the wrong order. And then I'm going to set care count to the character count. So this is where you're going to use that dot count function. You can find it in Zybook section 210. You can find the split in Zybook section 211. 2.14 is a three part uh, lab. The first part is the user's going to enter two words and a number, storing each in separate variables, which means you're going to have three input statements. The second part is you're going to create two passwords from those th 
three things that you input. Uh, and they have to be in this format. They have to be word one underscore word two, and then the number, in this case it's six, plus the first word, plus the number again. And then you're going to output the length of each password. So um, we, are, we know pretty much how to do the first one because we're going to um, just input three different variables. Um, then, sorry, then output the three values on a single line separated by space. So that's going to be a print statement, probably with a format. The second one is going to be a print statement with a format. And the third one is going to use the len function, L-E-N, which is going to, and they do talk about that in section two, but that's how you're going to get the length. So here's our flowchart of what we do. We declare word one, we declare word two, we declare, we input word one, we input word two, we input word three, well, sorry, we input num, we declare password one, we declare password two, we set password one to the num plus word one plus num. We set password two to word one underscore word two. Then we output password one, we output password two, we output the length of password two, sorry, password one and password two. Those are switched. Okay, so Zybooks section 2.7 will help you with creating the passwords and Zybooks section 2.7 will also help you with outputting and figuring out what the length is. Okay. Yes. Oh, that's okay, Josh. Sorry, it's always the same link. Um, well, that's a very good question, Jenny. So, um, but I want to show, I want to do something. Okay, and we'll go back and look at that in a minute. I want to show you guys something, and some teachers don't like you to use Google. I love my students to use Google. It means that they're thinking outside the box. So when you were asking about the find function, let's go out and do this. Let us go to um, Python. Python. Python has great documentation. So I am here. I'm, I'm going to go to docs by version. Let's just use the latest stable one. Uh, what's new? I just want the regular documentation, distributing, Python C, all right, quick search, find. Okay, stir find method, built-in types. Okay, so here I have a an entire web, a lot of web stuff. Just, and I apologize, by the way, for, for some of this font. It's probably hard to read. This is just on string functions. This whole page is just about string functions. So if I want to find out what find does, I can go out and look at it. And it says stir find, and stir just says it's happening on a stir. And then it will tell me return the lowest index. Um, should be used only if you need to know the position. So uh, this is what you'll do. Here's something on format. You get all of this stuff on just formatting a string. And there is more stuff on the Internet as well. So you can figure out what's at an index. You can say, okay, is, is whatever I'm looking for a number? Is it an alphanumeric? Is it ASCII? Is it decimal? Is it digit? All of this stuff that we don't even begin to cover in the class is out here and available for you. So go use the internet. And if a teacher gets irritated with you for going and using the internet, you uh, tell them I told you to. 
So your other question, Jenny, was um, why is it float and not pi? So I think that is this one. Is that right? String formatting? Yeah, that one. Okay. So here what I did, you're asking about this bottom one, right? No, the top one because you have pi set at 3.14 and then, but you have it located oh. as float one. Because it should be pi. Thank you for oh. catching me here. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. My apologies. Thank you. You're very welcome. I've been here for two years. Thank you for catching the air. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Um, does does anybody have any other questions? And would you like to see me run through some scripts since we've got a few minutes left? Would you? We have an assignment due this this week, correct? Yes. Would you be able to run through the assignment? Well, because it's on PyCharm, correct? Yes. So this is PyCharm. Have you guys have you installed PyCharm yet? I installed it. I haven't done anything with it. But from what I understand, we have to take a screenshot. No. Okay. Okay. So let's just start from the beginning. I'm just going to create a new file. So I've got PyCharm open. I'm going to say File New. And except I didn't have the right thing selected. My bad. File New. And I'm going to create a new Python file. And I'm going to call it test. So I now have an empty file that I can do things with. Well, what can I do? What I can do is I can write code and run it. So I'm going to write, let me make this bigger. When it turns green like that, that tells you that you did it right, correct? When it turns green, it says that it's correctly a string. Okay. Whereas, like, 42 is blue. It's not a string. It's an integer. Four, and that's, again, just treated as a number. So what you're going to have to do is you're just going to have to do a quick calculation. You're going to have to take in a name. So that will be and then you're going to have to eventually print that out and then you're going to have to figure out the year someone was born. So you're going to have to have, or you're going to have to figure out their age. No, age and you have to figure out the year they were born. So age is going to be and then you're going to have to calculate And then you're going to have to print them out. So this is just kind of the beginning. Um, but now what you have to do is you have to be able to run this. So to be able to run it, up here you've got this little drop-down. And that's Open Ed Run Configuration Dialog because PyCharm is not just going to run it for you. So you're going to have to edit the configuration. This is the Configuration Dialog. Ah, I'll explain that in just a minute. Good question. So what I've got here when I look at it is uh, here is just what the last script path was. So you have to have the right script path. So in this case, I'm doing the script path and I'm telling it to go to test.py. And then I have the compiler, so the interpreter. The interpreter, if you're using PyCharm, should have installed with PyCharm. So 
Um, if it doesn't, um, that's right. There are, and I can talk to that as well. Um, but you should have the Python interpreter installed, and that's what you basically need. What do you mean about different from PyCharm? The, was it the interpreter question? Python should have installed, sorry, PyCharm should have installed the Python interpreter with it. You shouldn't have had to do anything special. So that means I can run it. Now that means I can go up here and I can hit the run. And it's going to say, what is your name, Lisa? What is your age? 42. Okay. So the first thing, well, the question was, why is this int and not input? And the other question was, you know, Zybooks doesn't always have you do it. In fact, Zybooks hates it when you do that. So int, int is a function, and it is a function that converts a string to an integer. We have to convert the string that I'm going to put in here to an integer so that I can treat it, um, sorry, I can, I can act on it for arithmetic purposes, because I'm going to take 2023 and I'm going to minus the age and I'm going to get the year that you were born. So it has to be an integer. It can't be a string. Let me give you an example. I'm going to say um, x equal 10 minus age. And then I'm going to print x. Uh, sorry, let me go back and look. Uh, anything inside the input function. Okay. Um, it takes input as a number and input is actually a noun. I didn't understand that, Chris. Um, so, Zybooks is very persnickety. It expects everything to be exactly correct. And one of the things that um, it can be very persnickety about is what's in between you know, the opening and closing parentheses on an input statement. Zybooks prefers not to have anything in it. I, I think there's one or two instances where they're expecting you to have something inside the opening and closing parentheses of the input statement. That's all well and good for Zybooks. When I'm out there and I'm grading your game or this, I need you to tell me what you want to do. Because if I didn't have something in here, that's just going to sit there and wait, and I'm not going to know what to put in. So when you're programming in PyCharm, it's important to communicate with your user. For those people in my class, I'm your user. So you need to make it clear what I'm supposed to be doing. Treat me like I, I don't know anything. Um, so in this case, in the case of PyCharm, I want you to put something descriptive, oops, something descriptive in between that opening and closing parentheses so that I know what I'm supposed to put in there. Because if I'm just if it's just waiting for me to input something, do I input my age first or do I input my name first? So that's why that is. So now let's just do a quick example where I'm going to break things. So I'm going to remove this int and remove that parenthesis. So everything looks fine. There are no syntax error. There's no red squiggly lines. But if I run it, I'm going to have a problem. I'm going to put in Lisa. I'm going to put in 42. And I get an exception. This is an exception. This is Python saying, it may not be a syntax error, but you can't do what you were trying to do. So what was I trying to do? I was trying to say x equal 10 minus age. Well, because I had removed the int, I was no longer converting that 42, which Python, if it comes in 
through that input function, it is always a string unless you tell Python it's not a string. So I didn't tell Python that it wasn't a string. And what Python is telling me is that I'm not allowed to subtract with a string. I can only subtract with an integer. So that's what would happen. If I add that in back, that goes away. Uh, oh, wrong thing, wrong letter. Okay, and then I run it again. I say Lisa, 42, and I get minus 32. So that's why int. Could you do also age minus 10? Would it just produce positive 32? Yep. Okay. All right, I just want to make, because sometimes with code, you can't, you can't like put one thing first and, you know what I mean? Sometimes you just can't switch them around and do the old switcheroo. Yes. Um, luckily, when you're doing arithmetic in Python, it's just like you're writing it on a piece of paper. Okay. That's good. Um, so, yeah, and I know. noticed that when you had age and then you had a space, it did the red squiggly, so it was telling you that you had a space that wasn't supposed to be there? What it was telling me, if I do this, Python now put a bunch of red squigglies in. Mm -hmm. What I did was I unbalanced my parentheses. Ah, okay. So opening parentheses here and two closing parentheses there, and that's not balanced. You have to match. They always have to match in Python. In fact, a lot of programming languages, they have to match. Okay. So I can do one of two things. I can take this one away or I can put the int back in. If you see a red squiggly in PyCharm, there's a syntax error. So one of the other things that it's good to know is how to find where this file is because you, you in my class, you need to um, upload the .py file. So if I do... If I do a right click, now I have a Mac, so this isn't going to say the exact same thing as a window, but if I right click, sorry, no, just right click. There we go. I can see reveal in Finder. And if this were a Windows machine, it would tell you, you know, show in folder or something. And what it will do is it will come up and it will tell me exactly where it is. So all you have to do then is take this PY file and submit it into Brightspace when you're done. Can you do that one more time? So you just right click it and say re reveal. Yes. So in this in case, Finder. reveal in Finder. So you would right click with your mouse on the name. And then down here, you're going to see in my case, because it's a Mac, it's reveal in Finder. But I think it will be like show in folder if you're on a Windows machine. You click that and it actually will open up the folder that contains that file. And then you can just drag that into Brightspace. You can just drag that into Brightspace. That's all you have to do. Okay, great. And for students in my class, I actually have that up as an announcement this week, how to actually do that. So I'm not sure I understood. Um, hold on, wrong one. Chat. Because I I think our teacher said something along the lines of that he would not run script because it's coming from our computer. So he wanted us to do screenshots. But I'll go back and I'll I'll double check before I submit. That's fine. You do what your professor says. I will. I, I understand it's coming from other people's computers, but it's a .py file, and I don't think anybody in this class or in this program understands how to do steganography yet. So I will be running them for my class. I um, always run them. So, um, but Jenny, you do what your professor says. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Yeah. I when I talk about what I want it's for my students. Okay. Uh, 
And Chris, I'm not sure I, I understood this. So int takes the input as a number and int is an actually noun. Okay, thank you. I was confused. Does anybody, okay, a little cybersecurity there. <laughs> Okay, can I can I help you figure it out? And yes, Valentin, Valentin, is that right? Um, it is a little cybersecurity. I work for a cybersecurity company. We do things like figure out how to keep people from, you know, adding steganography to files. Um, so yes, I'm impressed that you knew what steganography was. So, does anybody have any other questions? Would you like to go? Um, ah, good for you. <laughs> At least you understand the joke. Um, so, does anybody have any other questions or want me to review anything? Going once. The answer, Jeffrey, will be posted on my YouTube channel. Um, actually, I will post all this on my YouTube along in the description section. There are a series of links. Those links are to, Google Dro to a Google Drive. That Google Drive has all of the scripts that I have prepared for this module, including all the challenges. One of those links is to the Lab 2.12. No problem. So, going once, going twice, everybody have a nice evening, and I will have this up tomorrow. Good night, everybody. Good night.